there's a certain problem and a certain value to notoriety or contacts. So the nice thing about our network, it's now very large. Um, I can easily reach pretty much any world leader in the world with something that would be legitimate. Um, there are, as you may have gotten from my comments, a number of very high net worth people who don't want to do this until it's a chicken egg. They don't want to get involved until they see there's something working, but we don't have something working until someone gets us something. And it's this chicken egg thing. So, and these are not people who are just, you know, wanting to be first to be second. They're sincere people, but they say, I gotta see something that can be independently tested and verified. It cannot be hearsay on, the, on YouTube. So we have built this massive network that is very substantial for the last 20 years, and it would be immediately activated. The other thing that would be immediately activated, and I want to talk about our strip, because it's like, what's the day after you get something that's confirmed? Well, first of all, it's going to be all over the internet. The reports, just like we did for the Atacama humanoid, from Dr. Lockman and the people at Stanford, are going to be on the internet. If you can read, you can read the report. Uh, so it'll be a prestigious universities and academics who will have tested it and said, this is what it is. They may say, we don't know where the energy's coming from, because if they were trained in classic or even quantum physics, they're not going to know a whole lot about the zero point energy field and quantum vacuum and all this, but they can verify the energy input and output that there are no tricks, and the lab will be able to say, from these plans, we were able to reproduce it. Now, we have many, many contacts who can do that part of it, but that would have to be released to the public in a very large national press club or similar event, but where you would have the provenance, the device there, you would have the test team reports there blown up, and you would have the pedigree for who the people were who reproduced it and tested it. Because extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So one of the few things I agree with Carl Sagan on. Um, and I think in this case, that's what you have to do, but it has to be a massive release to the public very quickly. Because here's the other thing that people working, like the group that took the Stan Meyer materials, they do not understand that time is your enemy. All right, the longer you perseverate and sit on something like this with the public not knowing, the riskier it is. It's very dangerous. Um, so you would want to get, you don't, you don't want to jump the gun and say you have something when you don't. On the other hand, at the instant you're certain, and I mean 100% certain scientifically, you want to do a massive. Now that would require a, a, a funding because just to do the, 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 the PR and, it, and, and the public education on this would run probably into the, you know, two or three million dollars. But I think that that's, that's less, uh, that, that won't be so difficult once we have something operational. I, I'll, I'll just say, um, a foundation I recently met with, the, the, the head of that foundation wants to help us, and he's raised for his foundation several hundred million dollars in, in the last few years. And, and so there are a lot of people watching what we're doing who are interested, but they're wanting, it's sort of like that old commercial, where's the beef? <laughs> they're wanting to see something. And I've been in the trenches looking for that where that really is, and, and our, our, our story of this has been both very, very promising, because I've seen things that actually do work, but then also incredibly disappointing to see how they get, disappear and get suppressed. Um, one of the reasons we do not want to fund any of these sort of inventors and scientists, even ones that had the bona fides of this gentleman down in, in, at the Huntsville Space Flight Center in the Redstone Arsenal, is because if they're a lone wolf doing this somewhere, no one knows who they are because they're an obscure person. That obscurity is dangerous. Obscurity is dangerous. And this harkens back to, you know, how my life has been ruined um, by being a public person on all this. You know, where if I walk into a Whole Foods, people know who I am many times will come up, which is fine, and I don't find it at all flattering. It's more often annoying than anything. But the, the, the fact is, is that millions of people are following what we're doing. When the film Sirius came out, the Huffington Post had it, it was the biggest story for almost a week on the Huffington Post. Millions and millions and millions of people reading about it. So we have a certain reach that a small inventor can't have. And what I want to do is say, if you can bring us the payload, we'll launch it. 
So we're the, we're the launch, and we'll disclose it. And, I, and you know, I don't care if someone threatens my life or offers me $2 billion. An intelligence director head back in 1992 offered me $2 billion personally, and then went to my wife and tried to convince her to convince me to shut down what I was doing. I said, I don't care about $2 billion. So you cannot be bought, and you cannot be afraid, and I guess because I had a near-death experience when I was young, I'm not afraid of death, and so you just have to go. Now, one of the things that was interesting after we were in New York uh, this past week, as I mentioned, I was, I was, we were at dinner meeting with a number of people, some very, very high net worth people, and we were talking about this. And someone said, well, what's the guarantee that if you had your own lab, you could just do it? I said, a guarantee? I think, you know, go ask my great, great, great whatever grandfather, who was called as the, one of the first prisoner of war with the British during the American Revolution, what the guarantee was that that little experiment called the American Revolution would have worked. I mean, if we are all so averse to risk that we're not willing to do something this important for the world, for our children and our children's children, and for Gaia, which is a living, breathing being, then who are we? You know, what are we as a people? I mean, if, if there was that level of a lack of courage and this sort of uh, putting your finger in the wind and seeing what the safe path is, there would have never been the American Revolution. All of us would be goose-stepping to Adolf Hitler's great-grandson, et cetera, and so on. So at a certain point, we have got to events the courage to do this. But we have to put that around something. Now, I'm willing to do that part of it. As are a number of wonderful people I've been working with for many years, some of whom are not known in the public and frankly don't need to be known in the public. Um, in fact, they'll say, <laughs> you do that. Um, but I think that that's why if, if we as a people come together and say, how can we support this? So that's one pathway to disclosing a device. Here's the challenge, here's the criteria, here's the award. There's another one, and that was the impetus for the film Sirius. Now, the film Sirius, as you all know, has been phenomenal. It was the largest crowdfunded uh, documentary in history, in history, period, um, to this day. Um, it has been seen by millions of people in the world, but most of the people who've seen it have seen it on pirated sites for free. Um, the intent of the film was that it would become sort of a, a rallying calls for the public to provide the donation so that we could open out near the University of Virginia where, where we live in a, in a wonderful area where there are a lot of talent. Um, a research and development lab, the, the budget of which is on the website, seriousdisclosure.com, it's about 6.4 million, uh, which most VC people, venture capital people, when they hear that number, they go, are you crazy to open a whole lab with all this high tech stuff and 18 people? I said, well, it's only for a two year period. That's just the budget. Um, I am highly confident that if we had uh, that budget, and that funding, we would be there. Because I'm sitting on, just let's say, some intellectual property given to me by a brilliant engineer who was being recruited by the CIA. And part of their recruitment was to let him go into secret files and copy things to study, which he kept and which he's now given to me. Um, it's thousands of pages of amazing stuff. But it's, again, it's pages two dimensional. You gotta build it up. And for that, you need a team. And for that, you need funding. Um, now, <laughs> we have only raised maybe a, less than a quarter of a million out of the 6.4 million for the Energy Lab. And you can go to our website, and there's a little ticker we change every month or two. And that's mainly because most people think someone else is gonna do this. To the people who have contributed, who are in this room, thank you very much. But you cannot open a research facility for that. The equipment list runs to a half a million dollars, and that is really pared down. So we don't even have half of what the equipment would be, never mind the building, 18 personnel with payroll benefits, everything. Because th these brilliant engineers and scientists that I've met, they're not going to leave their day jobs where they're making 150000 a year, 200000 a year as an engineer with benefits to work for free because they have a family, they have kids in college. I mean, let's live in the real world for a nanosecond. You know, you have got to have the ability. I was crazy enough to leave my profession and I have personally foregone around $8 million in, in income to do what I'm doing. And I have the most amazing wife ever that 
has been supportive of me doing this because she understands what's at stake. But most families would not put up with that. Um, and most people wouldn't do it. Uh, and you can't expect them to. So we have to be compassionate about the fact that people have basic needs to live. I mean, no one needs to get rich off this. We want to do it and put it out open source, but they have to have food on the table, and if their kids are in college and what have you, they have to have health care and blah, blah, blah. And then you have to have some degree of technology support, project management, and tactical security. Everybody know the difference between tactical and strategic security. Tactical means you got cameras there, <laughs> it's streamed on YouTube, um, you have certain secure areas so that people can't come in and just sabotage what you're doing and change a circuit. Okay, so you have to have security. Strategic security is what we already have that we built over the last 20 years, and that is all of you guys, the public, and all the people who are in the public but are in, in high positions waiting for something to happen, who are all the guys and women and agencies who are saying, we want to be first to be second. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be first to be first, because this is too disruptive. It's too controversial. And you know what? If you study the history of the world, the big changes that have happened have never come from the centers of power, right? Whether it was Rome or now the United States, you know, the, you know, the uh, Pax Americana. It, it's never coming from your, your sort of hidebound academic corporate and, and governmental centers of power it always comes from out here. Somebody in their basement inventing something like Stephen Jobs did or what have you. So this is something that I think similarly, but it, it has a unique challenge that a normal technology doesn't face. And that is if you come up with a better computer, Hewlett Packard may not like you or even Apple may not like you but it will come out there. There's no prevailing national security problem with that until you get to the uber supercomputers, which NSA are working on. Um, but if you do something like this that changes the entire way the world operates and the need for even a petrodollar and the need for oil and gas and coal and utilities and nuclear power, it is such a huge change. I'm going to say something here that people may take as hyperbole, but it is not. If you were to add up every technological development from the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s to now, and added it all up, the internal combustion engine, cars, planes, trains, jets, rockets, the internet, integrated circuits, biotechnology, medical, everything, this one area of physics, science, and technology absolutely in terms of its economic effect, its change in the way the world will operate, eclipses all of them in their aggregate. So 150 years of industrial development, this one area will be larger, which is needed. Now people say, well that's kind of very futuristic. I'm going, no, it's back to the future, because we should have had these technologies beginning to be developed and released a hundred years ago, except there were cartels like Standard Oil and uh, J.P. Morgan and other folks who didn't want it out then, and there are other cartels that don't want it out now. Um, the people who have a stake uh, aren't all in that camp, but they also don't want to step out in front of this freight train. Some people have asked me, aren't there some people, I mean, I was, there was a man who was a, and again, the reason I don't want to name names, you know, it's like Eleanor Roosevelt said, I'm going to paraphrase, uh, great minds discuss ideas, mediocre minds discuss events, and small minds discuss people, which is really true. Unfortunately, we've become very tabloid, internet tabloid, and people want to just gossip. So I'm not going to, I don't like doing that, but there was a man who, um, back in, uh, after the Disclosure Project, a National Press Club, a few years later, had been watching what we were doing, and he was a, a billionaire, and has a place out in Virginia, and he sometimes would let us use his, one of his, he had five private jets, so you could go here and there, and it was fun, but <laughs> he lived on 1,500 acres and had this house that looked like a UFO, with bulletproof glass, and then had a mountain that he had leveled off so one of his small jets could land there in a helipad, 
and then his, his, his wife had, an, had the Annabella mansion on the other part of the estate. Very interesting guy. Um, and he, um, he actually had his son, the day after Thanksgiving one year, land his helicopter in my meadow uh, to pick up a grocery bag, like you'd get from Kroger, of, of disclosure videos and material to take back to his father. It, it, and my mother was going, Stephen, what are you doing? Is what you're doing dangerous? Why is this man landing? <laughs> my poor mother. Anyway, so, <laughs> welcome to my world. It has not been, I think of my children. Couldn't have been easy being raised this way. So, um, oh, it's Thanksgiving dinner, wonderful, the day after, and here's this guy's landing a high altitude helicopter in our meadow. But the, 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 the scion of this family, very interested in all this, so he eventually invites me out to, to his estate, and we meet, and you know, he has pictures of himself with Ronald Reagan and all these people from all over the world, and I'm going, oh, oh, cool. So, he was very nice. He made a $100,000 donation to the to Disclosure Project so we could br m publish and move out the briefing materials into the Disclosure Book and all that stuff and get it at a very inexpensive cost during that period out to as many people as we could, kind of subsidized. And I said, well, that's great. Thank you very much. I said, well, what we really want to work on right now, the next phase of Disclosure, because we've done the thing with all the witnesses and stuff, and there were 800 million people, by the way, around the world saw that. Um, let's do the next phase and bring out the technology. He says, oh no. Hey, this guy's 85 years old. And I said, look, you know, I mean, come on, you're, you're in your 80s. Let's take, a, let's take a chance on this. He says, no, it's too dangerous. Now this is a guy who, out the tailpipe of his Gulf Streams, and he had five jets, could have funded this entire energy research lab, no problem. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable amount of wealth. But he said, he says, no, I mean, I, back in the late 60s, I knew the head of General Motors, because this man was an industrialist. And I said, yeah, so? And we're having lunch at his home at this flying saucer house. It's hilarious. Um, and I said, well, would, uh, what did you learn? He says, I learned that GM already had these technologies, that they were on a black shelf, but that this executive felt that it was time to end the secrecy on it and so that every GM car coming off the conveyor belt would be electric but not have to be plugged in. A true electric car, like what Tesla ought to have. And two weeks later, this executive was found dead of an apparent suicide. And he said, every single one of us knew that this man was not suicidal. But he was doing this from within GM and in a clandestine, in a way that was very quiet, and he was making too much noise, and he's dead. Now I said, well, can you prove that, that, that he was killed by some dark elements? He says, no, but everyone knew that's what happened. And I said, for that reason, I'm not willing to help. I said, what if you move the money through an offshore entity? No, they'll know where the money came from. Because they would. They'd absolutely know instantly. And I, he says, well, what, do you, are you afraid for your own safety? He says, oh, I don't care. I'll be dead in a couple years. Here's his old crudmudgeon. Fantastic. He says, but I have my children and my grandchildren fly around on my planes. And there could be a malfunction. He says, I'm not willing to do that. How many billionaires like that have I met with? More than a dozen. Every time it's a similar line. It's either, I don't want to get involved in this, something this controversial, or I'm afraid something could happen to my interests or whoever, or so the ones who know how the national security super state works, which is ruthless, rogue, and criminal, don't want to step and you know, touch this third rail and get, get zapped. Um, the ones who don't know are just sort of, if they don't know about that, then what their concern is, is that their peerage will be upset with them. What do I mean by peerage? people that they work with who would be adversely affected by such a disclosure of a technology like this.